Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm very impressed with those who sh showed up tonight. I got an interesting text message from one of our supporters that said, Brian, I really wish I could be there tonight, but our family has decided to head down to a hotel in Philadelphia on Broad Street. So we want to see the parade. So I know where their priorities are. So I really appreciate your attendance. We are uh, waiting, as you know, we uh, stream this uh, presentation uh, of, over the internet and we, quite frankly, with either our Distinguished Speaker Series or uh, other programs, our audiences actually can be as much as 10 times the number of people that are here. So streaming and the internet has become the way a lot of people like to uh, watch or, or participate in these kinds of events. So uh, are, how are we doing back there? We're, we're good? Okay. Well, I'm gonna start then. Uh, we are going to, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you again. Uh, so pleased that so many people from the Bernathan community could join us. I particularly wanna spend, extend a special welcome to the Karenwood residents that are here. Uh, it's always so nice to see you and how uh, uh, active you are in supporting us. So we have a, a program tonight that will include really three primary speakers and topics. I will start with talking about sustainability and growth of the college because we're really moving into a new era of how this college is going to be seen and uh, people are going to participate and with growth comes challenges. Following me will be Dean Thane Glenn, who will be talking about the insight to academics and the mission that we want to preserve here. And he will be followed by Dean Suzanne Nelson, who will be talking about student life contributions to the student experience and how important that is. We want to leave enough time for questions and answers here. And due to the fact that we have an internet off audience here, we're gonna ask you to pause and raise your hand if you have a question so that we can have one of our uh, staff here bring you a microphone because people that are watching on the internet need to hear your question so that they can know what they're, we're answering. So please wait for that. So with the introductions, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the team members here, the my, members of my cabinet that are here. Uh, Dr. Thane Glenn, who is Dean of Academics, Dr. Suzanne Nelson, who is Dean of uh, Students, Matt Kennedy, who is our VP of Operations and uh, Business Development, Dr. Wendy Klosterman, who is Dean of Faculty, and Dan uh, Allen, who is our CFO. And Amanda Lichtenstein, somewhere back there, Lilia Howard, who is our, our CIO, and Chloe Kuhn, who is our, helps us, uh, leads our um, advancement office. And I have a couple faculty members and other staff, so I'll, they're here. I'll just, you know, I, I might be taking longer if I try to get to everybody, but thank you all for coming. So tonight, um, I wanna lead off with something you are familiar with, but it's becoming more and more crucial to us in terms of this community, our alumni, and uh, others, and that is, how is Bernathan College, in light of growth, going to sustain its mission? And that mission really comes in different ways, and it has to do with the fact that we are a college. We want to continue to challenge our students with, as an intellectual student to think for themselves and live for others is our motto. And so with that, we want to introduce the concept of what spirituality means and through the, what we do here as a new church college, introduce the concept of, or the teachings of both the Old and New Testament and the writings. For many of our students, I like to tell board members and, and friends that for many of our students, this is the first time they've ever been exposed to any religious study. Uh, they've come from homes where there might not even be a Bible there. They're just not familiar with that. And so we have a broad spectrum of students to serve, but it's a privilege to do that. But we feel we have an opportunity to introduce them, and I think I'll speak for myself, but also my associates here, that I constantly hear, particularly at graduation time, what a difference this college made in their lives. And that's from people from all backgrounds. And so we want to continue to challenge students to think in a spiritual way. 
And I'd even like to talk a little bit tonight further about what do we find as students. When you think of a student, you think of a young person. You think of somebody millennial, between 18 or 25, somewhere in that range. But we're going to be looking shortly for lifelong learners and for uh, even older learners, including any of you here in this audience. So we think the college can expand its uses and how we serve people in a number of different ways. We're, of course, committed to undergraduate and graduate education. But through Providence, we think there's many more opportunities coming our way. I'd also like to tell you what my personal inspiration is about new church education, because I feel this personally in my journey, and I think many of you do share the same, and that is, how do we introduce students to understand how to trust in divine providence? Uh, our job is to introduce students and teach them about the spiritual matters, but also everything from student life, whether it's athletics, uh, volunteerism, studying hard, having a, an all-nighter with their friends, getting ready for a test. Those, spirit, those experiences grow everywhere. But I like to tell students you have no idea the kind of relationship or connection you're making with somebody right here today that might change your life completely 30, 40 years from now. And that's a little far for them to think out that far. But um, I do find that they do start to realize how this power it doesn't indeed, indeed affect them and how providence does lead them to hopefully finding a life of good and truth. And so we are, I'm inspired by these, these passages because, quite frankly, sometimes with growth and what we have here, people, I, I think we're still somewhat of an instant gratification society. We want immediate people to turn on to something or learn it, and it may take them a lifetime to see all of these wonderful teachings come together. So I believe in patience, but I also believe if you believe in divine providence, you'll know where it will may, you know it will take a while to get there. And so let's talk, I'd like to tonight talk about our educational resources. Um, we are committed to having top, superior, undergraduate and graduate programs. And Dr. Thane Glenn is going to speak to those. Uh, we want this college to be recognized as a very strong high, higher education institution. Uh, the education here we know is challenging. We know that sometimes when we get students from other institutions that transfer here, they will tell you this place is much harder than where they came from. And we see that in the academic skills that different people, different students come from. So we are blessed with an excellent faculty. We are blessed with excellent programs, but we also include with that student life, athletics, we want them to be engaged with the alumni organization. But with that, which are other hidden gems here, is the, uh, what we call our library and collaterals of new, of new Church Studies and Swedenborgian thinking that are found both in our, uh, our library, our special collections, and the Glencairn Museum. And we hope to expand on that because I sometimes see amazing things. For example, last summer, I, I got a call from our archive, our, our special collections leader, uh, Carol Odner, and said, I have a gentleman here from Duke University, and he is, uh, found Emanuel Swedenborg while he was doing, preparing his dissertation for neurological science. I, I'm not a neurological guy, so I can't tell you exactly what that was all about, other than he has a great love of, of what the brain and science does there. But I said, oh, I'd be glad to meet him. So I came over because he was in the, in the special collections reading some of Swedenborg's special works. He said, President Blair, do you know something that I, you probably don't, do you realize what Swedenborg really was a, was a man a couple hundred years ahead of his time? I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm a Mormon, and I'm going to stay a Mormon. But we start, I started in my research, I started to read about Swedenborg's pre, as he called it, pre-spiritual studies in neurological science. And he was 250 years ahead of his time, the way he wrote some of these discoveries. And I've started sharing it with other colleagues of mine, and I'm giving a paper on this in San Diego in a couple of weeks. And I want to come back here. I didn't know how to answer that. 
other than say, this is pretty amazing. But shortly after that, this summer, we had a conference that was headed by uh, Dr. Jane Hogan, one of our beloved uh, teachers and uh, uh, professors here, along with many other faculty members and staff. And to be honest, I was embarrassed again because we had over 100 academics here from around the world, from leading universities, who studied Swedenborg and the influence that Swedenborg had on the, their study of the arts. Now, I want to caution you, this was not because they were, quote, spiritually uh, inspired or anything. They just found his work to be, including a spiritual work, to be very, very fascinating on how it affected artists and the and development of art. And the conference was a, a, an incredible success for us. We, we shared with them our campus, Glenn, Karen, Karen Wood. I got the most beautiful thank you notes from these, these attendees from, again, all over the world and saying they can't wait for the next conference here at Bernathan College that would be associated with the study of Swedenborg. So I'm going to share with you a little bit later some facts that will also, I think, if you thought you're still surprised about the Eagles winning the Super Bowl, uh, I think some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight will even be more astounding. Uh, in terms of surprise. So we hope to have a conference, more conferences. We're going to do one on Swedenborg and his influence on 19th century American, or 19th American history. There is a, from now that I'm being, under, being revealed what's there, there's a whole slew of material and interest and studies there. And it's something that we think has many, many more roads of potential. So with that, I'm going to, get back to more of the business side of things. And some people will ask, uh, we, you may know we've had an operating deficit for some time, which we hope to finally close by 2021. And that's a cash flow issue where we've been using more cash than what we've been bringing in. However, at the same time, we've been able to raise a, a record amount of money, over $30 million in the last three years for capital projects and programs. So what that means is that our balance sheet and the financial strength of the college has never been better. But we do have to also preserve our cash. But we've had some incredible generous donors and groups that have helped to support us, and we're very pleased and humbled by that support. We want to continue to attract mission-fit students for a strong academic program and have a robust college experience. I'm going to show you in a minute, we are looking at record uh, applications for Bernathan College. And so as we get more and more applications, we can be, make sure that we find students who would, be, would really enjoy and get the most out of their experience here. But we, at the same time, we want to provide aid to those who wish to seek a new church education. Next slide really shows one of the key shifts in our business model here. When I went here, I didn't even know what I paid because my parents kind of took for it, but the uh, <laughs> generosity of certain families made it so that it was, it was really easy to come to Bernathan College. We had such a huge endowment and payout that we were uh, an endowment-rich school uh, with a rather modest, small group of students, and uh, so kind of people just kind of expected that. Well, between this most flat two years ago, 2015, fiscal year 2015, tuition accounted for roughly 35% of our revenues. However, by 2021, with the growth of our enrollment and the shifting of our revenue streams, we're going to have a more traditional model that says 65% of our revenue will come from tuition, which is, inconsist which is consistent with other colleges and universities. We will have less reliance on endowment and we'll have less reliance on gifts. We will continue, we have a program called Return on Assets, which is a revenue program to raise money from rentals and other programs. And already through the first year and a half, we've raised $500,000 with that. So we recognize that we have to spread the number of donors, which will come as we grow, but tuition is the key, we're going to be the primary source of our funding. And what that means is we have to have strong competitive programs 
that will uh, entice people to come here. We have to compete in this area here in Philadelphia region with 60 other colleges and universities. So I view that as a good thing because that only make us better at what we do. Our enrollment. During the first few years of, since this college made a plan to uh, build buildings or the board did and grow from 2012 uh, fiscal year, we were just a little over 200 students. Not a lot of students to have or uh, a large social life or lots of course offerings or whatever. But we had some fairly uh, modest growth. However, it is about to go very robust or aggressive. This year we had a growth in incoming student population of 34% over prior year. And next year, we're not ready to give you a number yet, but it looks to be close to 400 students here at the college moving to 500. Why are we confident we're going to hit those numbers? We passed a milestone this month. that We have over 1,000 applications in process that have been started from students who want to, are interested in applying here. You may say, well, that's a lot, but that's a lot this early in our normal year. We think we're going to have between 12 to 1,500 applications started. And that's, that, that is a little scary because we've not seen that kind of interest here. We've had, a, once students get everything in, they got to get recommendations, grades, board scores, and they have to write an essay about why they would want to come to a school like Bernathan in terms of its spiritual outlook and so forth. We want them to know. And so we've already had 400 in, and we're way ahead in those numbers compared to this time last year. I'm also incredibly pleased to see that the academic profile of these students is jumping dramatically. Last year, our academic qualifications jumped approximately 5% to 7%. This year, we're looking between 14 to, uh, 5, 14 to 16%, 6% if you look at GPA or SAT scores. That's over what we have currently in this last year's class. We've seen an incredible jump in scholarships. These are presidential scholarships for the highest performing students that have uh, the highest rank in their academic uh, background. And then also our, um, the financial capability of families has also jumped as much as 10%. With it. This has to do with when students apply for financial aid, they have to fill out a form. We analyze it. We work with uh, the government, but it's basically a, what's called a FISA, and that jumped $2,000 of available income per family. So we're pleased with that because that shows that we'll have stronger um, financial resources from our students. And finally, just jumping down to the last one is our new church, general church applications are up 30%. We have 36 that have been started the application and 24 have applied. So we think, in all in all, we have a great opportunity to grow our, our overall enrollment. However, we also have to match our costs to what we, have, we can collect from tuition from our students. We are still one of the lowest priced colleges for a private school in this area in terms of the quality we offer compared to our peers. Uh, currently, uh, when we started this analysis back in uh, 2011, the average cost per student just for tuition was roughly $70,000. That's a going out of business model. Um, to, we hope by 2021 we will be down to roughly approximately a little over 30,000, which puts us spot on with other private institutions here in Pennsylvania as an average. So all we want to do is narrow that gap. We want to try to recover as much revenue to match our expenses per student and we think we can accomplish that. Our net tuition and also and board versus what we call Mideast, Mideast Independent Colleges, that's another measure with other schools in the Philadelphia or the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, New York areas, is we were below the 25th percentile of schools if you go back to 2011, and by 2021, uh, we expect to be between the 50th and 25th percentile, which is spot on with the quality of education that we offer here. 
it's still when we look at the average well, after net discount and so forth will still be between 16 and $18,000. And our average student debt when a student leaves here is also very relatively affordable. It's less, it's around $20,000, which compared to other schools where students graduate with loans averaging up to $100,000 or $80,000, we're still doing a good job in our affordability. I'd like to then move on a little bit to programs and partners. Because this is a new, we would like to attract more students who would like to study here, like to study some, uh, about the uh, Swedenborg, like to study more about spirituality. That's not, we, we don't demand that, but we'd love to encourage more students who have that interest. Uh, we're going to be announcing some very exciting programs later this year that will be in a partnership with the Swedenborg Foundation and the New Christian Bible Study. Those two groups have had phenomenal growth in their viewership, and I'll share some of those numbers with you shortly. Uh, we were very pleased to have over seven Swedenborgian groups here that were partners of ours during the Swedenborg and the Arts Conference. To my knowledge, it was the first time we had every group here that really en engaged and enjoyed what we were doing. And these organizations are having phenomenal success in being able to reach new audiences, new readers, new uh, scholars, new, you name it, somebody, people that are interested in what we offer here. And so we want to replicate this program, do more programs, and we're in the process of coming up with a new or organization and structure to promote these kinds of studies. On the advancement side, we look to have a record level of giving over the last 30 years. As I said, we've raised over $30 million. Our annual giving has increased in terms of number of donors and large donors and foundations, however, wish to support capital projects and programs and not to annual funding per se. So there is a little challenge in what bucket the dollars go into, but we are, we are again have been blessed with those. As you can see here, this is the actual dollars that we, re we received over the last uh, several years, including eight to $11 million uh, funds that we've hit annually. That's gone to capital being the largest, which is shown in the gray, which is everything from a student union to special programs for faculty to develop faculty. And then our annual giving, which is in the red, is a much smaller percentage on that scale. But this is not too different than what other institutions face, except uh, the college is growing, but we don't have a huge base in terms of number of alumni. We have a smaller number because we were so small for the last 140 years. And so you have to build that base over time, which we're doing, and we have good plans to do that. But all in all, we've been very, very blessed and pleased with the generosity of our donors who are making what I'll show you shortly, the expansion of our campus. So I love this picture because it shows this beautiful amount of land that we can take advantage of. And this is a prime spot, a beautiful location. We have a, one other statistic we're really proud to share with you, and that's that when we have a prospective student come and visit us, 30% of those students will wind up enrolling. And that's an incredible, hit rate if you're counting how, how often you can convert into a deal. Um, but parents, students say this is a beautiful place. Last fall I had all the presidents from the private colleges uh, association here from Eastern Pennsylvania, over 35 of them, visit us here. Uh, it's the first time we had such a large representation of other college presidents come. And they said this campus is incredible. This is one of the most beautiful places we've seen. And he said, how many thousand students do you have? <laughs> well, <laughs> we're growing, under construction. But they were, you know, when you hear it from your peers, it's very humbling. Um, so tonight, I want to tell you that we are finished our planning and settled on specs for what we know will be an incredible student union and conference center. We've actually made it a little bigger. It's going to be over 26,000 square feet. It'll be designed to provide a social and fit, uh, uh, meeting place for our students, which is sorely needed on this campus compared to other schools. 
They don't really have a place they can call their social home. Um, and we think this will help greatly in attracting students as well as retaining students. Um, but we're also pleased by the fact that we're going to have conference rooms, meeting space. We're looking to already planning conferences and programs here as well as to rent out this space to other uh, organizations that we feel are useful and would be helpful for our, our school. Some of the pictures, and we'll start publishing these shortly, but we're going to have uh, an, on the top left here, top left-hand corner, a beautiful uh, cafe that will be open all day in the early evening. Students can go and get, or even public will invite you to come in. There will be a coffee shop, sandwiches, light snacks, another wonderful place to socialize with others. Uh, on the main floor on the bottom left is a very wide open space where they'll be able to do everything from little concerts to speeches to congregating and there'll be different separate pods there. And then, which is important to students today, and we've heard this, they need a uh, fitness center and health center which will be on the bottom floor and along with lock, uh, locker rooms. Today, uh, roughly 40% of our student body are commuter students, and they need a place to recreate. So I just want to say we're going to also be announcing later this year plans for a new building arts village. It will support our building arts program. Uh, as you may know, we're, or have heard, we're the first college in the United States that offers a Bachelor of Fine Arts in this subject material. And I have Ken Leap here in the audience tonight, who's one of our highly admired and respected faculty members who is an expert in stained glass. Uh, we have many other people here, including Steve Hartley, who recently joined us this year, who is uh, world renowned, widely known for his uh, skills in the building arts. And we're just, I, I'm not allowed to say yet all the things we're doing, but it's, Timing wasn't right for tonight, but very shortly we're going to announce some very exciting plans for this. Swedenborg Foundation. Now here's my little surprise tonight. Um, a year ago, a little over a year and a half ago, we brought the Swedenborg Foundations off the left eye um, media group here. They were uh, at another location here in Bernath and, and they needed more space. So we made space available in what has been the known as a social, old social center. And so uh, Curtis Childs, Matt Childs, and Jonathan Rose, and Cara Dom, and others that are on that team both do the video and media piece as well as the translations moved to that particular location. And they found a home there. And they really enjoy working on this campus because they have access to our brilliant faculty and all the other um, scholars that uh, have an uh, interest in Swedenborgian studies, but they're a really fun group. If you watch their videos, they're very eye-catching. And so they've been so pleased with what has gone on that they've made a long-term commitment to build a professional television studio on the bottom floor. And it'll be something we can use as a college and to do professional video productions. It's worth over six figures in terms of what this kind of studio will be. But I'd like to share the most important statistic tonight with you. The foundation has had a steady increase in viewership. And I talked to Curtis the other yesterday, and he said, Brian, this month, month of January, they had 3,200,000 minutes of viewership of their material. I repeat that, 3,200,000, and it's going like this, 200,000. If you translate that into the number of viewers, that's between somewhere between 75,000 to 100,000 viewers who are watching content produced and taped right here at Bernathan College. That's a lot more people than are members of the general church, not to put anyone in one category. But 75,000, that to me is a golden opportunity for us to ha find a way to reach to that audience because as Curtis says, they're, they're hungry for more and more information. And that little group on their own has done an incredible job of reaching clearly a huge audience. And so you're gonna hear some amazing things that we, we hope to do with the foundation shortly. 
But I, uh, one of the ways we do this, how we work with the foundation, is one of our theologues, um, uh, Chris Dunn, who is in theological school, has an internship where he goes over there and answers questions about faith and Sweden, life matters related to Swedenborg. And at our board meeting on this Friday, I'm going to have him t share some of those stories. They're heartbreaking. I mean, they're really moving on how w that, that message is really hitting people. And so we would like to find a way to get some of those people that might want to study over here at Bernathan College. And we're going to find a way to do it. I am certain between 75,000 and 100,000, there might be a few that would be interested. Uh, so I just tried to do, I'm not a statistician, but I do believe there's a share of that market we could get. And so we will be telling you some, uh, we are working on another new program that will introduce our college to a, literally hundreds of thousands of potential seekers. With that, we need also to have a better way of introducing our faith and principles to people as they walk in the door. Um, that's also been awkward for us. And so we're going to be, we're working on what we call a Swedenborg Welcome Center in Brickman Center, an interactive board wall that people can ask questions, download stuff under their iPhone. Uh, there's just a lot of promise there. And as a college, we think we can do that. And with that, we're going to start preparing ourselves for distance learning. The theological school already does that today. They train students in Africa, Europe, Asia, via Skype and other kinds of online, real-time media. And we're planning to do that with uh, other programs that we'll again be announcing, where we literally could jump to thousands of students someday if we find the way to reach them. And finally, I'll end with my portion to say there's a lot of farmers in this town. And we've had the uh, community gardens, but we are changing those to a new garden that will go somewhere else on campus as we've had to start the planning for the current location for future parking and building locations. So the college has a lot underway, and that's one of them. We need that land because it's prime to our campus here, and you'll be hearing more about it. So. We've been working with friends of the farm and others. I just want you to know we will be moving to a new location because I thought I might be asked that question tonight. I would now like to introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Thane Glenn, who's going to talk to you about academic programs at Bernathan College. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. It's great to see so many people here this evening. It's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the state of our academic programs, um, where we are, and, and some of where we're headed. And I just want to uh, start with kind of some of the big picture behind our academic programs and give you a sense of our mission and the goals of our academic programs. So the ultimate goals of a new church education are really envisioned in the image of the New Jerusalem descending from heaven to earth at the end of the scriptures. And in our teachings, we're told that fundamentally we bring the light of the New Jerusalem to earth as we learn to bring genuine love and true wisdom together in a life of use. In a sense, that's fundamentally what Bernathan College is all about. Uh, love and wisdom together in a life of use. This is, of course, a very familiar triad to anyone who has read the theology of the new church. Another version of the same triad shows up in the first and most fundamental law of divine providence, which says that God creates each of us to act in freedom according to reason. So there's that, that triad again. Love and wisdom in use, freedom and reason in action. And this concept of freedom, reason, and action underlies the core academic program here at Bernathan College. So I thought I'd just start by, by uh, mentioning this. So our whole curriculum is designed around this. Uh, our curriculum challenges students to critically explore their freedom, to reflect on what they love, on what is most meaningful, what a spiritually purposeful path looks like, what a spiritually purposeful set of choices looks like, 
And that's not just our religious uh, religion curriculum, that's throughout our entire curriculum. Our curriculum also challenges our students to bring the full capacity of their reason to bear on the choices they make. These traditional liberal arts perspectives we're uh, based in ask students to look at the world, the world of nature and the world of spirit uh, from every discipline, from every angle. And finally, our curriculum challenges our students to learn the skills that will allow them to put a well-reasoned, purposeful life into action, into use. Some of those skills are very traditional liberal arts skills, good, good writing, uh, effective speaking ability, uh, quantitative reasoning, the ability to gather and analyze information. But also, we're uh, increasing our focus on job skills, internships, and the, the sorts of things that students will need uh, to succeed in a career. To the extent that we teach our students to bring love and wisdom together in a life of use, I think we succeed in our education. So the question is, how are we doing? Well, like any organization, we have indications of success and we have some challenges that we face. And I'm just going to spend a minute telling you about some sort of high-level uh, indications of success in our academic programs and, and some of the challenges we face in our academic programs. So I'll start with some successes. At the heart of our academic programs, as has always been the case, is the study of religion. A student who is here for four years will be required to take at least six courses in religion. And for the most part, and this, uh, I will confess, sometimes surprises me, for the most part, they seem to love it. Not always on a day-in, day-out basis, but if you look at the satisfaction rates uh, with our religion curriculum over the last seven years, the overall satisfaction rates with the religion courses is 89%. Now, that's, we're not at 100% yet, uh, so we could, we could do better, but that's pretty high. This is one of the highest satisfaction rates of any corner of our curriculum. And uh, I think an even uh, more dramatic indicator of success is the satisfaction rate in our Religion 101 course. This is the um, course, the Introduction to New Church Concepts, particularly geared for students without any Swedenborgian background. These satisfaction rates over the last seven years are at 95%. That's pretty impressive. A new church perspective and the spiritually purposeful framework it carries permeates every part of our curriculum. And what we find is that rather than our students from non-Swedenborgian backgrounds writing off the education here as too religious or, or culty or um, you know, too uh, philo philosophical, what we find is that every year, consistently, a larger number of students is interested in coming to study here. And I think that's an indication of success. President Blair spoke earlier about our work of planting seeds here and trusting in divine providence. Trusting in divine providence perhaps to grow the church in different ways in those whose lives are touched by Bernathan College's education. And I'll just say that I think over the last decade um, we've learned so much about how to speak about the new church, about how to talk about new church concepts to people without any background in Swedenborgian uh, thought, um, just by trying it. We've learned so much by trying it that we never ever would have learned by sitting around a room and speculating on how we might do this. Um, and so I think we're gonna keep trying. Uh, that's, that's uh, I think, the best way for us to do this. And we do face some challenges. Uh, I just want to mention two tonight. Two of our most significant challenges in the academic programs are uh, we're still struggling with some academically underprepared students, uh, particularly students who are underprepared in quantitative reasoning. I would call it math um, and writing. Uh, but I think we're seeing some positive trends. So I just want to show you, show you two uh, graphs here. This is a graph of the last five years of the average range of SAT reading and writing scores for our incoming students. Um, and so you have the last five years and then on the far right for you uh, is the benchmark range of in SAT scores of incoming students in our peer institutions, small liberal arts 
institutions. So you can see we kind of dipped down there a little bit, and we've been steadily climbing back up to the point that we are now um, back uh, to, the, to where we're exceeding uh, the benchmark of our peer institutions. And I, indications are that we're going to see those scores continue to rise. And there's a similar, uh, similar movement in our, uh, the math scores, SAT scores of our incoming classes. Um, so you can see a similar dip and a similar rise there. So that's encouraging. The other major challenge that we're facing in our academic programs is career and career preparation. Um, our surveys indicate to us that our students, on average, perceive themselves to be less prepared for careers by their Bernathan College education than do their peers at other institutions. Now, that's a, a very subjective measure. It's their own perception of, of how well they're being prepared for careers at, at their college. Uh, but it's, it's well worth our paying attention to. And so we're working on a proposal right now to create more robust career services, a career services program that will coordinate closely with our academic departments. And career preparation is an increasing focus in our major programs. Just ask you to consider two examples from very different sides of our curriculum. Our business major has recently been developing an increasing focus in finance skills. Uh, with the idea that this will help to prepare students for some specific career paths. And then on the other side of our curriculum, our English major was recently reframed as an English and communications major with an increased focus on media communications and design as well as focus on internships. So we're, we're making steps in these directions. I just want to spend the rest of my time this evening telling you about uh, some of our developing programs and initiatives. So we've, you know, going back 140 years, we have been a, a liberal arts program, a liberal arts college, and we continue to build on that core of our liberal, art, liberal arts programs. But we're starting to add programs now that we believe that can particularly serve the world uh, with a new church focus. So I'll uh, talk to you briefly about two recent developments, our business major and uh, our nursing track, uh, and just offer a thought on how these programs can particularly serve the world with a new church focus. Uh, let me speak to the business major. Bringing a perspective of spiritual and moral purposefulness to business management I believe can have a profound impact in the world. And if you think particularly about the new church teaching, the fundamental new church teaching, that the heart of charity, the heart of our spiritual work, is in how we approach the business of our daily occupations. Uh, that can certainly profoundly reframe the importance of business management. And I think that's something we can offer the world. And then in the nursing uh, track, one of the reasons that Jefferson University wanted to partner with us, so students, uh, get their uh, core program here and then go to Jefferson for the, the specific nursing program. One of the reasons they wanted to partner with us is precisely for the clarity of thought and purpose that our faith-based liberal arts education can provide future nurses with. Um, and so there, we have something special to offer there, and, and that can be a niche for us. I want to just speak about two developing programs that we're working on right now. Uh, one is a graduate education program. We, of course, have an undergraduate education program, which uh, in the last two years has been able to offer state certification. Now we're working on developing a graduate education program so that we can train not just teachers, but teachers of teachers and leaders in the education field. It's an opportunity to give new church education, which is obviously at the core of our mission, a broader reach. Specifically, we're planning a graduate program in special education with a literacy concentration. We have a unique opportunity to bring together uh, principles of new church education with the focus on spiritual growth and the development of the whole child with some cutting edge programs in literacy development. And we think that we can become known for that, for that uh, combination. The other big new program we're working on developing is our building arts major, which uh, Brian alluded to earlier. 
We have an incredible heritage in Bernathan of stunning craftsmanship in the service of spiritual principles. We have an opportunity right now to become a premier educational site for the study of traditional craftsmanship as an expression of spiritual aspirations. Our plan is to start with tracks in glass and metal work and then gradually to expand into wood and stonework. We think this can become a signature program that will help Bernathan College distinguish itself in a very highly competitive market. And it's uh, an incredible opportunity to align ourselves with the historic district here in Bernathan. And I'll just close by letting you know about um, a couple of new faculty initiatives underway uh, designed to help strengthen our mission in our academic programs. The first is uh, an orientation program for new faculty. Now, we've had an orientation uh, program for new faculty in place for many decades. But under the leadership of Dean Wendy Klosterman, we are creating a more robust orientation program uh, our new faculty orientation now includes extended readings about the new church, about the history of the academy, and about new church higher education, and includes meetings throughout the first term and the first year uh, of the new faculty member with the dean, with other new faculty, and with the department members to discuss uh, these readings and discuss different ways that new church concepts might be particularly relevant to the field of the new faculty member and look for ways to create a dialogue between their discipline and new church ideas. And the other new development, this is very exciting thanks to some generous support of donors, uh, we've been able to start a new church faculty development fund. This is a fund to help support new church teachers and those who show promise in the new church of becoming great teachers in pursuing terminal degrees and pursuing uh, PhDs. Um, which will strengthen our program here. As we grow, it's of central importance that our fac faculty is deeply committed to and engaged with the mission of higher education in light of new church teachings. That's at the center of this uh, continuing vision of bringing the light of the New Jerusalem to the world. So that's uh, my spiel for tonight. Thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Suzanne Nelson. everybody. Thanks for coming out, the weather. Having recently come into this position, I wanted to take the opportunity tonight to share with you the philosophy of student life at Bernathan College and highlight some of the exciting developments in our area. There's a lot to be said about having a great college experience. It encompasses so much and in truth, it's difficult to define because every student's vision is a little bit different. One thing, however, is for certain, and that is that the learning process in college occurs both inside and outside the classroom. To this end, student life strives to support the development of students by engaging them in activities and experiences that contribute to their overall learning and to their spiritual growth. Student life includes the following areas, and I have the privilege of working every day with a dedicated team of professionals who support our students. In student life, we are student-centered. We maintain that student life is just that, student life, and we are here for the students. We employ a holistic approach, recognizing the importance of each student's physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. In other words, the student life point of view considers that not only does an individual read, write, and calculate, but also has worries, hopes, loves, and fears as well. To that end, we offer programming and support services so that students can embrace their personal goals and truly thrive during the time that they have with us at the college. Student life is accessible, and we maintain an open door policy. As a staff, we listen and appropriately incorporate student input, ideas, and critiques into our decision-making process as we develop and implement policy and procedures 
that address a variety of student needs. Our small community environment here at the college allows us to take this very hands-on approach with our students. It's one of the things that sets us apart from larger institutions. Whether a student needs help negotiating a leave of absence, is coping with homesickness or a health issue, or wants to organize an event, our team is there to assist at a very personal level. And we have the wonderful opportunity to develop personal relationships with our students every day because we're such a close-knit community. Diversity, integration, and inclusivity are hallmarks of student life programs. And at Bernathan College, we strive to develop a culture of trust and charity among students, and we champion an inclusive college community where every student is treated with dignity and with respect. We want all students to have the opportunity to discover their purpose, to go out and make a difference, and have a sense of belonging, not only here in Bernathan College, but out in the world when they leave us. As part of this process, student leaders naturally emerge and become instrumental to more meaningful and successful student life programming. There are always teachable moments. In keeping with the mission of the college, we have high expectations and hold both our students and ourselves accountable. We emphasize use, love to the neighbor, and charity as we challenge our students to become their best selves. Sometimes things don't always go as planned. There are always going to be challenges. But by trusting in the Lord's providence, we can turn a difficult situation into a learning opportunity. It is inevitably through life's challenges that we are all motivated to grow and change. Whatever the concern may be, we as a student life staff are committed to helping students work through complex issues. We care deeply about our students in addition to collaborating with faculty and staff to do what's in the best interest of our students, we offer a variety of professional resources in student health to proactively address the medical and psychological well-being of our students as they navigate an increasingly complex world. For example, we work closely with healthcare providers to ensure that students who are in crisis or in distress have access to mental health care. In fact, we have recently restructured our counseling services to meet the rising demand that has been observed around the country at universities and colleges. We are all about building community and encourage our students to live on campus because we believe that residence life is an integral part of having the complete college experience where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Living with a diverse group of individuals expands social knowledge outside of the classroom, giving students the opportunity to appreciate individual differences and varied life experiences. Residential communities create that wonderful sense of family. How many of you that lived in a campus environment can recall a funny college roommate story or staying up all night studying for exams with others in the hallway of your dorm? These are the moments that enrich our lives. And as a means of providing even more opportunities for our students to create these memories, we're excited about the new student union. Currently, students have few places to gather on campus, as President Blair mentioned, and this new facility will dramatically change that for our students. Over the past year, the Student Union Committee has worked on the design from the inside out, guided by the principle of use, and that the right framework can inspire creativity, nurture social interaction, and continue to build community. We recognize that form and function are not just shaped by architects, but by the very individuals who primarily use the building, and that's the students. To this end, our students provided wonderful insight, ideas, and feedback as the building plans evolved. We have no doubt that the student union will become the social heart of campus for our students. And you've, also, you've already gotten a sneak peek at what is going to be in the student union with the fitness center, locker space, um, recreational space, the food court, 
campus store, lounge, gaming area, and study areas. The second floor is what's most exciting to me in student life, because here student activities, student organization meetings, and community service and leadership seminars will be emphasized. And this space is so um, needed for our students to have an area that they can call their own. Community service is a significant part of life at Bernathan College. I'm proud to share with you that over the past year, our students have initiated and or participated in over 30 community service events. And I think that's really incredible given the size of our student body. Program areas in the student union will intentionally overlap so that the building will become an almost continuous beehive of activity, ensuring a very dynamic experience for our students. With so much to offer, our hope is that the student union will propel enrollment growth, retention, and draw all of us even closer as a college community. We're also thrilled about our new partnership this year with Sage Dining. A strong dining program strengthens students' ties to the school and to one another. Sage is dedicated to quality of service, nutrition education, sustainability, and food that is prepared by using small batch cooking with seasonal, organic, and locally sourced ingredients. They're cutting edge when it comes to addressing the special needs of certain students who have food allergies and or other dietary restrictions. SAGE is, is contributing to our mission by creating a strong feeling of community as part of the dining experience, assisting with our student employment program, and supporting the Department of Education garden-based learning experience. Moving forward, SAGE, along with Friends of the Farm, will be key in developing our Farm to Table initiative. Beyond the practical aspect of providing nourishment, Tending a garden can lead our students on a spiritual journey as they celebrate the miracle of life. With continued growth, the student life team is excited to maintain a vision that supports the mission and strives to meet student needs appropriately and effectively. Doing so will no doubt involve identifying what really works and where we can benefit from critical thought and change. Ultimately, our goal is to engage students in campus life in order that they may have the fullest college experience possible, hopefully increasing their satisfaction, enjoyment, and development as a whole person, and ultimately contributing to their spiritual growth. One never knows, in addition to a sound academic foundation, it may just be the experiences and relationships that were formed outside the classroom that bring a student back to their alma mater after graduation. Thank you. from those in attendance here, and uh, we would like you to raise your hand so we can pass the mic to you, and then we will answer. I really appreciated the program tonight. That was great, and I, I like hearing about the challenges as well as the successes, because it feels real that way. Um, I find myself having mixed feelings about your quest to raise the uh, SAT scores of your incoming students. Um, I just wonder if it limits the broadness of the student population that um, uh, disadvantaged students in their previous academic careers might be kept out. I'm just curious, what's the thinking on that? Thank you. That's a great question. This is something that we've talked quite a bit about. Um, one thing I will say is uh, we will continue to have quite a wide range of, of students uh, admitted into the college. Um, 
what we have found over the last several years is that we really don't have the resources to um, support the number of, of really academically underprepared students that we, we were getting for a while. Um, the last year and a half or so has felt um, much more manageable. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, President Blair wants to speak to this. We, we currently are working on, um, we're working with uh, policy and admissions that um, we will, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we will admit any um, student with a new church background who wants to come to study here, uh, at least provisionally. Um, but, uh, you know, if I can share one, one quick story with you. Um, when we first started actively recruiting um, uh, beyond students with a new church background, uh, we saw a dramatic shift in the academic preparedness of the students who were coming to us. And I had a conversation with the then uh, associate director of admissions about it. And, and he said, well, Thane, what you don't realize is that you guys have been teaching Ivy League students for decades and decades, and you just thought they were normal students. Now you're teaching normal students, and, uh, and it's a little bit of a shock to you. So, um, so I think uh, what happened five years ago or four years ago is that we actually dipped way below normal students in our average range, and now we're working back towards the the range of, of normal students, and hopefully we'll get a few Ivy Leaguers in there too. Do you want to speak to that question, Brian? I'd just say, it's the speaking with other college presidents, it's a universal national problem with underprepared students. They in turn blame some of the high schools, and the high schools in turn blame some of the elementary schools. But the, quality, the preparedness of our students across the country is a major concern. And um, this college was designed to offer a high level education. It always has, and we have to recognize that. I think we'll welcome different diverse groups, but most importantly, and from a sense of charity, uh, we need to make sure we feel they can succeed here. So I'm, we felt that based upon the failure rates of some of those that were underprepared, we don't want to encourage someone who really has a poor chance of succeeding. I don't think that's charitable. Both Brian and Suzanne said something about retention when talking about the new student union. And I was wondering, do you have a problem with retention of students and also the old model where a Bernathan kid like myself might come for a year and then transfer out. Is that not looked down upon when talking about retention? Good question. I'll answer the first part and ask my colleagues if they wish to add. We used to be equivalent to what was a junior college or less. Most, many of us only went here one year because there weren't the courses or fields of study that we wanted to pursue. I hated to leave here, but back then there were no business courses, and now we have a very popular business major. In fact, next coming year we'll have 16 different majors offered here, which is a wonderful selection. The only thing we don't do right now amongst that are popular are engineering. So some of those students will leave for that reason. But the real problem we faced because we had uh, not done the right right evaluation of students who were admitted here is because of academic failure. And we had a large number of students, unusually large group of students who were had to leave because they could not keep up with the rigors of our studies. So it's something we got to look at. The second reason is um, we're a small school and we have a limited amount of social things and so forth, if, if, to be perfectly frank about that. That's why we believe uh, uh, f having a larger student body, having a social center with a student union, and more programming that I know Suzanne and her staff will look to do, will make it more attractive that students find their, their place. 
I, I just draw the conclusion again that when we went here, part of our social life was being invited into Bernathan homes with our classmates. There was always a party off, off campus. Uh, for our students who haven't got that network, they have to find another form of social life, so we have to create that for them. And it's complicated, but we want to get that back up to what national averages are, which are about 60 to 65 percent of the students who would matriculate here. Finally, I'll tell you that five years ago, maybe six years ago, when we had graduation, 80 percent of our graduates were with associate degrees. Today, it's 95% of our graduates have four-year degrees when they have a graduation. So that whole paradigm has shifted 180 degrees. Any? Um, I'll, I'll just add uh, two, two quick thoughts. One is um, we will always, always, always welcome with open arms any student who wants to come here specifically for the experience of, of studying the religions and, and working with our mission. Um, so that's not changing at all. Um, and then a very technical thought for you. Um, we are able to define our cohorts in different ways. So we can define the cohort that, um, that uh, in, indicates when they come in that they are intending to get a four-year degree here and look at retention rates based on that. And we can also expand that cohort and look at retention rates based on everybody who enters. But um, so we're not, uh, we're not in any situation where we uh, need to worry about students who are intending to come here for a year or two. What I meant by retention rate in the student union referred to trying to keep um, students on campus and um, the student union adding to our residence life program because there isn't a lot in the immediate area. They don't have a lot of places to go, um, not only just to hang out and have fun, but um, more importantly, the student activities area, they don't have the space to um, have their community service organizations have a space and keep their supplies. And um, so that will all be part of uh, the student union and I think will create more of that sense of community for the students and um, an ownership feel that they have a, a place to go in a number of different areas, um, whether it's studying or having fun or, or going um, to go and get something to eat. But right now that really, um, that doesn't exist. So I think it's a real, the students feel it's a real game changer in the feedback that we've been getting from them in terms of staying on campus and enjoying the environment here. I have a question about your fitness center that's going to be going in there and wondering whether it will be um, a fitness center that is just for the students or whether it will be for the students and the faculty or whether it will be for the students and the faculty and alumni and wondering whether uh, one of the things that I think President Blair spoke to was back in the day there was more relationship within the extended community and really wondering what colleges are thinking about at this point in life whether the keeping people who are all the same age together and that that's their experience for this window of time which is actually pretty unnatural um, or whether, you know, inviting more people into the space, whether there's a philosophy behind that. I'll answer the first question about the fitness center. The fitness center uh, will also be coupled with our health center. Uh, we have a extensive amount of health services we have to offer to our students, and it also with training and rehabbing for our student athletes. Our plan right now is to limit it strictly to the students and, and faculty and staff um, because of the size and the space that we had. Colleges have different operating requirements. We've had some contention with the high school and the way they wanted to operate it, and they had absolute right reasons the way they wanted it, but it was different than kinds of needs and regulations we have at a college. 
And so that's, for right now, the way we have to uh, approach it, but we'll always evaluate it. I'll let Suzanne talk about cohorts. And um, I think that one of the, even though the student union is focused on student life and primarily for the students, it's still gonna be open to visitors. There will be conferences held there. Um, the wonderful event that was put on by Matt Kennedy, Light Up the Night, um, at the end of that event, everyone said, well, where do we go now? And it was a tremendous um, coming together of the community of Bernathan and our students, and everyone wanted to go somewhere after that. Um, it had gotten dark, and where was the next place that they could get together and co-mingle? So, I think um, it may not be in the fitness center where you'll be, they'll be co-mingling with um, different age groups, but certainly it's our intent that in that main area, you will be invited in and all the surrounding wonderful areas of this building to visit. Um, our, our students love being invited out to the community. Um, they love to interface with all of you. So um, I, I think it gives us that opportunity to do that. Um, in a number of different ways, um, not only from a community service standpoint, but also just in the building on that main floor. Are we uh, still too small, like to have exchange students, that type of thing, like other colleges do? We do have an, we call it an international exchange program. Okay. Uh, we have specific agreements with certain universities, primarily in Europe right now, where uh, the student can come here tuition free. They have to pay for the room and board, mm -hmm. but in turn, our students can attend that institution. Okay. I believe currently we have three students who are great. And I, one of the initiatives I'm looking at for the next couple of years is to try to get more international students, particularly from new church groups that we used to attract, but we could not offer the full ride scholarships. Mm -hmm. But there's some other, um, we think some other ways we could make that work. So we, 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 yeah. we think international experience, I'll say for a personal standpoint, I know several of our faculty members, I think that's an invaluable learning lesson to oh, go Oh, I think it is for the students that have done this in other colleges. No question. Have gone, yeah. It's a six-week thing, is it? Or no, it's a term. It's oh, it's a, a term. whole term. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But anyway, I think it's good if that can happen. I think that is the questions for tonight. We've kind of come up to the time that we wanted to make this uh, session available. I really, really want to thank all of you in town that came out. We're very honored. And if there's ever any questions or thoughts you want to share with us at any time, as Thane said, we have an open door policy. <laughs> we welcome the inter interface. I also will say I see, see Dave Cooper in the back there. Dave's uh, is the president of the Alumni Association. We would love to see more of everyone get involved with that. As a healthy alumni association is also an invaluable partner for us in terms of working with uh, future needs and supporting both our students and our alumni. So thank you. <laughs>